Morning, Glory America. Bonjour, hi, Canada. You're here live from Studio West. I'm so glad you're with me on the last broadcast day of the year, December 30th. I hope you have a wonderful New Year's Eve tomorrow night. Nobody needs to go out. You can watch Ohio State beat Georgia tomorrow night. I've got a dinner writing on that. I went out with my pal Gary Walensky in our small group. We have a West Coast church group that we've been meeting with for, I don't know, 15 years. And, of course, Walensky is a big Eagles fan, so we had to hear about, yeah, 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 the Eagles were 13-2, and two, and so I got past that, and, and I was prepared for it. I braced myself for it. And then we got into trash talking about Georgia and Ohio State because people who don't love Ohio State hate Ohio State because they are excellent in football defined. So that's tomorrow night. I don't know what you folks are doing. I'm taking the fetching Mrs. Hewitt to dinner tonight, and she understands Ohio State's in the semifinal for the national championship where it's on from 5 to 8.30, I think. It's going to take three and a half hours tomorrow night, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, At the bottom of the hour, I'm giving you my 20 New Year's resolutions. I made a list yesterday of resolutions. Now, resolutions for New Year's are a dime a dozen, and they usually involve more exercise, uh, eat better, drink less, lose weight. I'm where I I don't drink. I have a, uh, I'm at my target weight. Uh, I don't need to quit smoking. Uh, I'm doing my miles. I'm getting my physical therapy and taking my relief factor. And so I'm doing all that, and so my New Year's resolutions are of a different kind. That's coming up at the bottom of the hour today. I'll put it on the podcast so you get to share in my New Year's resolution, but let's run through the news first, shall we? Mortgage rates record biggest calendar in- year increase in 2022. Uh, mortgage rates rose in the last week of 2022, capping off a year of increases that bought 2021's pandemic-fueled housing boom to an end. The average rate on the standard 30-year fixed mortgage rose to 6.42% from 6.27% last year. Now, Andrew and Todd.com are sponsors of my show. They don't sponsor news like that. They hate news like that. But I tell you about it because it's it's just a way of saying to you, if you listen to me and you bought a home last year, you know I'm I'm a good reservoir of smart financial advice. Uh, I, because I don't suggest anything crazy like crypto. I've always told you crypto is nuts, and I remain by, uh, by that stand. So listen to me when I tell you about yesterday's market and what gold means to you next year. Brought to you by Birch Gold. Go to hughgold.com or text my name, Hugh, to 989898. Yesterday, the market soared 345 uh, points. S&P went up 86 points. The NASDAQ jumped 2.5%, a total of 264 points. Overseas this morning, it's a little bit down. Gold went up to 1822 an ounce yesterday. Now, I, again, end-of-the-year markets are very misleading. People are trimming, they're selling losses, and they're realizing gains at a huge scale, far beyond the ordinary investor. But in the middle of that, we do see those mortgage rates going up. We know that inflation is here. We know the interest rates are going to go up. So now is the day to go to to go to um, HughGold.com, HughGold.com, or text my name, Hugh, to 989898, and get the free information kit on opening a silver or gold IRA. If you get it budgeted this year, you can do it next year. You can open an IRA for 2022 right up until April of 2023. Birch Gold will do that for you. Make that your first New Year's resolution. Yesterday, Ukraine was rocked by a massive Russian missile barrage. Now, I wrote a column in the Washington Post yesterday about how Putin is an evil person and how we know that by reference to our shared Judeo-Christian morality, which remains an echo in the land. It is not a practice in the land. Only 31% of people go to church, synagogue, mosque, or temple weekly or almost every week. And the propagation of the basic Christian faith, which has powered the West since 1500, in its variety of, of practices, whether you're talking about the Baltimore Catechism or the Westminster Confession, that's going away. How in the world are we going to be able to judge good and evil when... and come to the conclusion that Putin is evil on this latest Russian attack. Scores of uh, Russian missiles fired at Kyiv and other Ukrainian cities Thursday in what officials describe as one of the largest daily barrages of a month-long campaign targeting the country's infrastructure. Putin is trying to freeze these people to death. That is a war crime. We're dealing with a war criminal. Xi Jinping is a war criminal, not a war criminal. He's a human rights criminal. They're committing genocide against the Uyghur people. We know people like this. And the Ayatollah Khamenei is gunning down thousands of people in Iran. We know Kim Jong-un, Il, who is the, the quartet of tyrants. They're all evil. We make that judgment because we have a morality against which we can make reference and judge action. And that morality tells us there's, there's no doubt here. 
This isn't a gray area. It's not uh, Jean Valjean stealing a loaf of bread because he's got to feed his children. That's lay mise, if you don't know. Not a gray area. And how, how come it's not a gray area? Because we have a Judeo-Christian ethic in the United States that is fixed and certain. And I worry about that it's declining. One of my New Year's resolutions will be about that. Uh, there was a story in the, Israeli, in the Israel Times, this morning, Times of Israel, Netanyahu names Ali Cohen. Dermer gets strategic affairs post. Now, if you listened to my show yesterday in the last hour, Dr. Michael Oren was on to discuss for two segments, live from Tel Aviv. We posted the audio and video of that at my YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube, Google Hugh Hewitt and YouTube. Watch Dr. Oren tell you about it. Don't read the stories in the American press. They're, they're all wrong. All of them are focused on the wrong thing. I read like 10 of them last night. They're all worried about the right-wingers in the government and the West Bank. What you need to know is about the security cabinet in Israel, and it's serious, and it's tough, and it's full of veterans, and they're going to take on Iran. If we don't do it, they're going to do it. The best solution is for us to do it in tandem. From the Telegraph in Great Britain, Joe Biden distrusts his Secret Service agents and, quote, believes they are Trump sympathizers. There's a new book coming out in the new year. Um, it is written by Chris Whipple who is a pretty good reporter. The fight of his life inside Joe Biden's White House. Now, that's going to be the sleepiest book I've ever heard of. I don't know if I can get through it. But how are they selling the book? They always take the juiciest part, release it early. Joe Biden doesn't trust his Secret Service agent. I'll bet you he loves his Secret Service agents, but he got wound up into a grandpa moment. And I had this talk last night with my wonderful friend, the amazing, remarkable Joseph Timothy Cook, who is 82. And I said, Tim, should you be president? He said, I'd be a better president than Joe Biden, but no. And I think most 80-year-olds realize they shouldn't be president, and most 80-year-olds shouldn't sit for book interviews. I also believe that. Uh, after a half century, the New York Times reports, Fauci prepares for life after government. I can't imagine anyone caring about this story. I, I, I wish him well in retirement. I wish him a long and happy and a healthy 20 years. May he have five score and 10. Go to 110, Tony Fauci. You did your best. It's time to go away. And the New York Times knows it, and they're giving you a farewell. Take the hint. What's next for the economy? This story comes from the Washington Post. Job market has been a bright spot for months. I don't think so. The unemployment rate of 3.7% remains near historic lows, but it's not really the unemployment rate. It's how many people have checked out. So what's next for the economy? Reports Abba Batari. Economists aren't quite sure. Big surprise there. There's no question that we're in for more of a cool down, though it's unclear how rapidly or dramatically that might happen. The Fed is hoping to slow the economy into a gradual controlled descent, though many experts agree that things could quickly spiral down, possibly leading to a recession. Quote, our recession probability models have moved to uncomfortably high level, Morgan Stanley economists wrote in a recent report. Tighter financial conditions and market volatility suggest recession in the next 12 months is a coin toss. It's not a coin toss. It's a done deal. The recession is here. It's going to be painful, and it's going to go for a while. The markets are forward-looking. So when I gave you the market report from Birch Gold, that sounded like good news. The first week of the year will tell us whether or not they think uh, inflation is tamed and growth can return. That's real growth. As I, as I told you, there are two stories. The bravery and the recklessness of Ukraine's improvised army. Uh, that comes from the Wall Street Journal. And from the Wall Street Journal comes inside the Ukrainian counteroffensive that shocked Putin and reshaped the war. Both of these are probably 10,000 word stories. I've read them. I'm going to summarize them for you. I'm putting them on the back shelf for tomorrow. And then if you listen to the Grand Old Pod yesterday, I did a little editorial on how the legacy media never understands what's really going on. And, and I think Bill Schur is a pretty good reporter at Politico. He's a liberal, but a pretty good reporter. Here is 20,000 words of conventional wisdom, and most of it is simply wrong. That's not what's going on in at least half the presidential campaign. The reason you need to sign up for the Grand Old Pod, and that is available exclusively to members of the universe, 99 cents. Give it a shot. Listen to Tuesday's program and listen to yesterday's program. I was, I was um, flying on Wednesday, so there is no grand old pod on Wednesday. But I did one on Tuesday and I, with Dwayne where we did the odds of the Republican winning the nomination. And then that Republican, if they got the nomination, beating Joe Biden. 
That's pretty comprehensive. And yesterday I explained to you why legacy media doesn't know anything about what Republicans are in, because they don't like Republicans and they don't get out much with the Republicans. So please listen to me. Go and sign up for the universe. You get the radio show commercial free as a bonus. But the grand old pod is over there, and pretty soon I'll be, you'll hear my New Year's resolutions at the bottom of the hour. I'll be adding more to the universe, and I think you're going to want to get that. Stay tuned, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. December 30th, last live broadcast of the year from Studio West. I just want to say one great thing happened in 2022. It's hard to find great news in 2022. The Ukrainian resistance that they did not fold up is great, but the cost of Ukraine has been so high. And it's been such a savage war, it's hard to say great, though it's been inspiring how Zelensky and his people have fought back against the Russian bear. But apparently after two years, and actually two and a half years, of relentless campaigning by people like me, but mostly Secretary, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Senator Tom Cotton, Congressman Mike Gallagher, and a few others, TikTok has become radioactive in the United States. Parents, get it off of your kid's phone as soon as you can. Here's Mike Pompeo in November talking to Brian Kilmeade on Fox about TikTok. Cut number eight. A hundred percent. And if the government won't do it, parents should. Uh, We've been talking about this for a long time, Brian. I think now three, three and a half years ago. This is a powerful tool with deeply embedded AI. And it is an element of the Chinese security apparatus. So think about your kid's Face, facial recognition features, who their friends are, all everybody they're talking to. This information is all available to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the FTC chair has it right. The Trump administration had it right, although we didn't get it done. Uh, we need to prevent this tool and all the others like it from impacting American security. But yet I see our former president and Pompeo wanted to get it done. talking to a They TikTok had many song. national security meetings on this. There was resistance inside the executive branch, primarily from Treasury. Uh, The president wasn't persuaded. He didn't get it done. Now it's finally getting done because Congress passed a law. And I actually saw Mark Warner yesterday saying Donald Trump was right about TikTok. And I thought, when Donald Trump, it was Mike Pompeo. Cut number nine is Mike Pompeo from the summer of 2020. Apparently he started in 2019. I couldn't find that clip. Here's Mike Pompeo in 2020 saying the same thing. The mission set is to protect American national security. And in this case, uh, the information of American citizens. And so... Uh, whether it's TikTok or any of the other uh, Chinese uh, communications platforms, apps, uh, infrastructure, the, this administration has taken seriously the requirement to protect uh, the American people from having their information end up in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. And so uh, we are working through a process uh, where all the relevant agencies and the private sector are getting to say uh, their piece. We, we hope to have a set of decisions. They, they didn't get there. But Mike Pompeo did everything he could. Tom Cotton did everything he could. Representative Gallagher did everything he could. Business interests did not want to antagonize China. Look, if you've got TikTok on your phone, they are collecting a lot of data on you and probably malware on your phone. And if your kids have it, they are building dossiers. And they're not active dossiers. They're not like spying on your children. They're collecting data on your children. So if you've got a 16-year-old, <clears throat> they know wherever that 16-year-old is going. They know whatever those 16-year-olds are watching. They know their tastes, their friends, the people that they send stuff to. TikTok is putting a ring phone into your child's life that goes right to Beijing, to the CCP archive, so that if in the future they ever want to find out about Molly or James, Joe Bag of Donuts, they're going to be able to do it if they were ever a TikTok user. Now, it's like smoking. You can't undo what you've done. But you can get a lot better in a hurry if you stop. Take it off of your phone. Indeed, if you can afford to, get a new phone. Never put it on there. And the American government now has made it in the House of Representatives and the Congress. No TikTok devices. No phones allowed. It's just spyware and it's malware. That's your first New Year's resolution. Second New Year's resolution. Hey, knucklehead caucus, get off of it. People are angry. The dinner we had last night... Just normal folks. They're not particularly uh, uh, political. They know it, too. Listen to what Kevin McCarthy said to Bill Hammer yesterday. Cut number one. Look, our goal was to stop this Biden agenda, win the majority, and fire Nancy Pelosi. We achieved all three of those. I've been leader for four years, and all we've done is win seats when every other Republican entity has lost during that time. 
We're sitting and talking to every person in the conference. We've had our primary after the election, who to be the nominee. I won that by 85% of the vote. I do not think at the end of the day that five Republicans are going to hold up our opportunity to secure the border, or that five Republicans are going to sit back and make us not be energy independent, or let this runaway spending continue, because that's what will happen if we don't. Mm -hmm. We've got to find a way to work together for the next two years. Otherwise, we'll lose as individuals. Uh, uh, just in a word here, quick. So, listen, Matt Gates. As of today. Listen, I, Andy Biggs. Please listen, Matt Rosendale. Everybody knows what you're doing. You've made your point, whatever it was. Uh, as many concessions as you can get, you're going to get. Stop screwing up the agenda. We cannot afford the delay on China. We really need the Select Committee on China up and running. Come right back to The Hugh Hewitt Show. America, The Reckoning for Avatar is here. Sonny Bunch, the official movie critic of The Hugh Hewitt Show. You can find him on Twitter, at Sonny Bunch. You can see his podcast, Sonny Bunch. The bulwark goes to the movies, or he has a second one across the movie aisle. Uh, look for those on podcast networks, wherever they are, Spotify, Apple. Sonny Bunch, how is Avatar doing at the box office? You know, uh, that's, that's a tricky question to answer. So the short answer here is it's doing fine. I mean, uh, if you want to look at uh, how it is doing compared to other movies that have come out this year, uh, just to pick one day at random, not really at random, it's the most recent day we have numbers, the last Wednesday uh, that we had, Wednesday, um, the, the Wednesday that just happened, it grossed uh, more on that Wednesday than any other film has made on a Wednesday in 2022. It made $20.4 million at the domestic box office, um, which is very good for a Wednesday. Now, look, this is a weird Wednesday, right? Because I was just uh, about to ask, is that, a, is that a data signifier or is there an empty set to compare it to? Yeah, I mean, so so this this whole stretch uh, basically between the the week before Christmas through the week before New Year's uh, Day through the first couple of days after New Year's Day, it's it's a little bit of a weird stretch of time because it's like uh, summer, right? It's like summer except in winter. You have families at home. You got a lot of people home from work. Um, you've got people on vacation. Uh, so you've got kids home from school. So in theory, every day can be kind of like either a summer day or a weekend day. So it's, it's, a, it's a slightly weird Wednesday. Uh, that said, it is still the biggest of the year. I mean, it's, it's bigger than, uh, it's, it, I think it's, let me see, it's $6 million better than Top Gun Mavericks. Uh, first Wednesday, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big number regardless. It's a big number regardless. Um, so the, the short version is it's doing, it's doing pretty well and it's doing what people kind of expected it to do, which is to hold very well. This was not a movie that was going to open, uh, at Marvel blockbusters style numbers. It wasn't going to open at $200 million. It wasn't going to open at $300 million. Um, that's not what James Cameron movies do. James Cameron movies are very famous for having very long legs uh, and putting up very strong multiples. Now, uh, a very quick crash course here, a multiple um, in the industry is how they describe what a film grosses compared to its opening weekend uh, box office. The average opening weekend multiple is about 2.7, okay. 2.5 to 2.7. It just it depends on... Uh, some some factors, but that's on average, 2.5 to 2.7. Um, as a way of comparison, Titanic had a multiple of 20. Wow. Um, Titanic Whoa. had a multiple of 20. Um, uh, Avatar, the first Avatar, had a multiple of 10. Um, so if you, uh, and those are obviously, those were at the time the number one uh, highest grossing film of all time by the end of their their runs. So Titanic was the best grossing film of all time uh, because it was in theaters for a long time and it was just not it was number one for like twenty weeks in a row or something. I mean, it was some some crazy absurd number. Avatar similarly again was number one for many weeks in a row and had very famously low drops from weekend to weekend. Um, this is not. I don't think this is going to be a movie that has a multiple of 10. If it has a multiple of 10, it will be the highest grossing domestic picture of all time by like $300 million or something. Um, I, so I, I don't think that that is in the cards here, but I do think that, you know, it's going it, to, it had a, it had a solid opening weekend at 130 million. It's going to end up in the 
550 to 650 million domestic range. But where this money, movie's going to make all its money, um, or where it's going to, you know, really, really show its worth is overseas. And here's the interesting story, Hugh. This is actually the most interesting story about avatars from a business perspective. Um, Avatar The Way of Water, everyone expected this movie to do gangbusters in China. Everyone was kind of counting on this to grow 600 to $800 million in China. Chinese audiences love the original Avatar. It's the movie um, that was released, re- like re-released in theaters during the pandemic when there was nothing new out and made an, an extra $100 million in China just during the, the, the re-release How weird because people had nothing else that? to see. Um, huh. But the the it is not doing well in China right now. Now, it's not doing well in China for a bunch of reasons. Basically, China is in the midst of... They're all, they're all sick. COVID surge. Yeah, they're all sick. So, so, you know, that that is... It's not, it's not going to put up the 600 to $800 million everyone thought it would there. And that, you know, in theory, that would be a huge problem for the movie. But it is doing so well everywhere else in the world. It is currently... It just passed $1.1 billion worldwide. It's the highest grossing worldwide uh, movie from Hollywood uh, this year. Um, it, it is grossed more worldwide than Top Gun Maverick, which was the previous number one. Um, again, it's at $1.1 billion. By the end of the weekend, it should be at around $1.4 billion, um, which means that it's two-thirds of the way to getting to $2 billion, which is about what this movie needs to, make, to break even. You know, I mean, it, it was a very, very expensive picture. It was a very, very expensive uh, movie. Hey, Sonny, quick question. How do they yeah. finance a $2 billion movie? You uh, you get a lot of very rich people to put. No, I mean it's it is it's like anything else. There there are there's a studio that is backing it. You know, 20th Century Fox, what used to be 20th Century Fox, is now 20th Century Studios, which is Disney. Disney is putting up the money for this. Disney has still a lot of money, despite you know uh, stock problems and and theatrical problems and uh, park problems and all that. They still have a lot of money. They put up the money for this uh, and. I, I, it looks like it's going to pay off, Hugh. I was skeptical. I was, I was honestly very skeptical that this was going to make money, particularly with the situation in China. But you don't bet against James Cameron. Well, you um, knew I was so skeptical because I'm not going to see it. But when Dwayne took his teenagers and said it's visually stunning and the most predictable movie ever, but nevertheless visually stunning, uh, and he didn't fall asleep, I thought, okay, maybe I'm wrong. But... Two billion dollars is a lot to make back. I'm just curious, do they spread the risk? Do they just try and spread the risk and reinsure it by having everybody in the world invest in it? Well, there, there. I'm sure there are other partners who have kicked in a little bit here and there. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure this is mostly Disney financed. I, I'm pretty sure that this is mostly, you know, the again 20th Century Studios. And this was in the works. This movie was being made. Remember before uh, Disney bought. 20th Century Fox. So, I mean, this is there's some there's some carryover risk here. Um, there there could have been a huge write down. You know, they could have if this if this had really bombed, they they could have uh, had some some stuff to write off. I mean, Hugh, again, I, I, Dwayne's right. I, this is the most visually stunning film I've, I've never seen anything like it uh, in a movie theater. It's the sort of movie that only makes sense to see in movie theaters. And this is why when people talk about avatars limited cultural impact, what they're basically saying is it's not a movie you watch at home over and over again on repeat. It's not a movie that you're trading quotes with friends because you, you watch it 10 times on HBO, right? It is, it's a sort of movie that you basically have to see in a theater to get the full impact from it. And that's why it is going to end up grossing, you know, about $2 billion somewhere. I, if I had to guess right now, I would guess it winds up somewhere between 2 and $2.2 billion. But you never know. I mean, look, here's the thing. The word of mouth on this thing is fantastic, but not for plot reasons. Not like people are saying, oh, it's the best story I've ever seen. You know, I, I it was so moving. It is very paint by numbers. It is, if you've seen the first one, um, you've seen basically the story here. It is, it is about uh, evil humans invading the beautiful planet of Pandora and treating the, the natives with disrespect and killing them and taking their land and uh, you know it's basically the story of uh it's it's the revisionist story of the the cowboy and indian films right um so like the movie is not a narrative masterpiece this is not the godfather it is not 
uh, you know, Goodfellas. It is not not stagecoach. You're going to watch over and over again. It's not stagecoach. It's not. It is, but it is. It is. It really, really is one of the singular uh, visual accomplishments of uh, the, our cinematic age. I, there, nothing I've seen has ever looked anything like it. Um, it is. It is really transportive and transformative, and I, I, I can't recommend. It. But I will say, look, the only reason to see this movie is to see it in a theater in 3D. You know, on preferably IMAX. IMAX. Right. So I got to get another question to you for the New Year's long weekend, which is fetching Masuda to like football. So I've got to find a movie. Is there anything she will like? And you don't even know her. Is there anything that, you know, someone who's been married 40 years to me will like in the theater? Boy, Uh, that's a tough question, Hugh. I don't think she's going to be a big fan of Babylon, which is the three hour, uh, you know, the three hour history of Hollywood movie. Um, I don't think she's going to be a fan of Violent Night, which is the uh, you know, absolutely the scary not fancy, scary Santa Claus movie. Uh, you know, The Whale is the sort of movie um, that m- she might enjoy. I think she might whale. like The Whale. She got the a big whale, heart. Yeah. The Whale, yeah. So The Whale is look. It's it's a uh, it, it it is it's one of these uh, Darren Aronofsky movies who directed Requiem for a Dream, Black Swan. Uh, it's very intense. And it's very, um, it is occasionally a bit degrading to the, the main character. Um, but it is, it is very much a movie about people who need people and, and people learning to uh, look past the, the shortcomings, the physical and otherwise shortcomings of uh, a yeah, I call I call her a high empathy person. And I think well, the whale is made for high empathy people. It, it, it is, it is. It, but I also think high empathy people can be a little bit put off by what Brendan Fraser's character goes through in it. Uh, you know, without spoiling things too much, he's a, he's a 600 pound shut in who is going through congestive heart failure. Um, he's trying to reconnect with his daughter. Uh, it reminds me a bit of it's, it. The setup is very similar to the wrestler. Did you see the wrestler? With oh, the I love the wrestler with uh, yeah, Mickey, it's, Mickey, whatever his name is. Yeah. yeah Mickey Rourke. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a little bit like, it's a little bit like that in, in terms of setup. So it, it's I like think that. we she can like see that. that. High empath. Yeah, yeah. empath. There's a word for people who have high empathy. Empathath. I don't know what they're called, but em- empaths. Empath. Empath. That's right. it. She's an empath. Um, yeah. I am not. I, I am a uh, once upon a time in Hollywood person, which is not a high empath movie. It's just fun. Uh, I've got to ask you a very quick thing. I saw a trailer for a new Brad Pitt movie. Have you seen it yet? Uh, Babylon. Is that the the. the I don't know if it is. Is it about? Ba- it just was the same Brad Pitt movie I've seen since Ocean's 400. <laughs> well, I mean, it, uh, I, assuming it's Babylon, you know, it, it is, uh, it, it, so this is a, again, it's a three hour history of Hollywood movie, uh, about the, the magic of movies, but not really. It's a little more, um, uh, it's a little darker than that. It's a little, it's the darker side but, of it. But Brad Pitt's in it? Brad Pitt, I, Brad Pitt's, Brad Pitt's good in everything. Margot Robbie's in it. She's great. Um, well, then she's going to go see that. She'll go see any Brad Pitt movie. George Clooney and Brad Pitt, they could make, uh, the on the road movies again and she would go see it so. yeah i mean his it's funny his subplot is the least necessary to the movie uh without without spoiling too much but uh you know i i look i i would recommend it it is dying at the box office folks are not interested in seeing a three hour three hour uh his gilligan's island epic about oh my god uh, you know, early hollywood but uh you know it's uh if you like brad pitt it's definitely there's there's okay sunny bunch you, you gave a kind of a warning there so people can't accuse you of failure yeah. to warn more airline miles for you sunny bunch you can see him at across the movie aisle you can see him at the bulwark goes to the movie and listen to him to his two podcasts read him in the washington post thank you sunny bunch follow him on twitter at sunny bunch Morning, Glory America, Bonjour High Canada, live from Studio West on this, the last broadcast day of 2022. Coming up at the bottom of the hour, my New Year's resolutions for 2023. Maybe you can adapt them to yourself. I got 20 of them, and they're not of the standard variety. Lose weight, stop smoking, drink less, exercise more. I'm pretty good on all that stuff, Uh, but I'm going to give them to you, and you can figure it out. I do want to alert you. I think your number one New Year's resolution ought to be to subscribe to the universe because the grand old pod has turned out better than I ever imagined. And yesterday and Tuesday's grand old pod, I was traveling on Wednesday, but on Tuesday, 
We ran down, Generalissimo and I did, the 17 would-be Republican presidential candidates. And it doesn't mean they're all going to run. doesn't mean two of them are going to run. Well, the only one who's declared is the former president. But we ran down the odds of them getting the nomination and then the odds, if they get the nomination, of beating Joe Biden. I can't set a line against somebody other than Joe Biden because we have no idea. You know, if Jared Polis runs, he will be a formidable candidate and he'll put Josh Shapiro on that ticket. If Kamala Harris runs, not so formidable, but she'll put Josh Shapiro on that ticket. So the grand old pod, and it just came home to me yesterday when the Politico published an endless piece by Bill Shear, S-H-E-R. Fine writer, doesn't know a lick about the Republican Party. I mean, it's just conventional wisdom cubed. And they don't get us. The grand old pod is a pod by a Republican, me, for people who vote in the Republican primary. That might be independents, it might be Republicans, and for every member of the Republican National Committee, every member of the state Republican Party, every member of every county Republican Party, every candidate who's ever run with an R next to their name, past, present, and future, all of the activists, all of the interest groups, and it's taken off. I hear about it all the time. People just love it because it's just the news that they never hear because it involves, for example, Glenn Youngkin successfully getting the sales tax repealed in, on groceries in Virginia. That's a small deal, right? You haven't heard that because most national shows won't tell you about it. But I told you about it because it matters to Virginians who are listening to the show right now. But it matters also when you look ahead to Glenn Youngkin running for president. One of the things you're going to talk about is, you know, look, I ran for office on a couple of things, getting control of the schools for parents and getting rid of the tax on groceries, and, and you'll talk about it, and you'll hear it here first. The Grand Old Pod runs through every story that comes out in the cycle on any of those 17 or on the party generally. The biggest story of the new year will be, does Kevin McCarthy get to 218 on the first ballot, which he should? Uh, there is actually nothing to advantage the Knucklehead Caucus. They get nothing if they hold out for one, if they, don't, if they vote present. The only way these guys can win is by declaring victory. And they're all men. And the three that I remember are Matt Gates, who's knucklehead in chief. Andy Biggs is a good guy, and I don't know why Andy's wrapped up in this. And Matt Rosendale, who my friend tells me is a good guy and might have won the Senate except for this escapade. He's not going to get the nomination now, I don't think, unless he stands down. But Kevin McCarthy was on with Bill Hemmer yesterday. I want to play that cut number one. Look, our goal was to stop this Biden agenda win the majority and fire Nancy Pelosi. We achieved all three of those. I've been leader for four years and all we've done is win seats when every other Republican entity has lost during that time. We're sitting and talking to every person in the conference. We've had our primary after the election, who to be the nominee. I won that by 85% of the vote. I do not think at the end of the day that five Republicans are going to hold up our opportunity to secure the border or that five Republicans are going to sit back and make us not be energy independent or let this runaway spending continue because that's that's what will happen if we don't. Mm -hmm. We've got to find a way to work together for the next two years. Otherwise, we'll lose as individuals. Uh, uh, just in a word here quickly. Do you think you have the votes as of today? I, I think on, on January 3rd or before then, we'll have the votes. All right. So good for you, Kevin McCarthy. I hope that the best thing that could happen right now is for Matt Gates to come out and say, I've talked with the leader. And in fact, I'm going to support him for speaker. And I hope everyone else in the caucus does. And then people will leave you alone, Matt. But if you screw this up, you have already screwed up the transition, but it's not irreparable. If you screw this up and just give storylines about Republicans in chaos, that's all on you, friend. And all of them are going to get primary. We'll talk more about that. I want to tell you about last night's dinner. Uh, I have a small group, the Fetching Mrs. and I belong to a small group that began in our church that no longer exists, uh, a casualty of the Presbyterian Wars, believe it or not. But the small group has got five couples in it, four of whom were able to get together for a wonderful Christmas dinner last night. Jan made wonderful lasagna, and it was just a great time to get together with friends we hadn't seen in six months. But I taught, two of them are doctors, doctor and doctor. And so I was talking with, with Dr. One, the guy. I said, how's it been? He said, wow, it's been quite the year. Um, and he doesn't blame COVID. He said, patients have become so entitled and... Some of them have become abusive towards their medical professionals. I thought I would just relay this to you. I don't, I don't think I am. I'm going to make a mental note. It's on my list of resolutions to thank my health care providers. I think I, I'm not demanding, but apparently it is not unusual now for a doctor to receive an email 
And I'd like a call on this, 1-800-520-1234 if you're a doctor. It's not a, and this is one of the most saintly people I know. I mean, he's just been in the field forever. He's younger than I am by about probably 10 years. He's probably 56. And he'd been doing this as far as long as I know. He's a, a general practice medicine. And, you know, he has to refer people. People send him emails that say, I know that my shoulder needs a replacement. Please schedule an MRI and refer me to a shoulder specialist. And he said, they don't want to come see me. They don't want to talk to me. They just want me to do A, B, and C. They've been on WebMD, and they've diagnosed it themselves. Moreover, the patients that do come to the office are peremptory with him. And this is a change that's occurred over his entire career. And they have a list of 20 things that they want to get done in their 40-minute appointment. And when they when he can't do it, because they've got uh, you know, a, a number of patients they've got to see every day. That's why you schedule a half hour or an hour. Uh, they get angry. So patients are getting angrier, and patients are becoming more demanding, and patients are demanding instant diagnoses via email, which of course is malpractice, you can't do that. In most cases, I said, do you think telemedicine contributed to this? And he said, yeah, telemedicine did, because people are now used. There's something you can practice over telemedicine, dermatology, for example, not completely. Sometimes you have to go in. But make a mental note, would you? And it's going to be in my New Year's resolution list at the bottom of this, that be nice to your healthcare providers and be nice. My nephew is a pharmacist and he tells me horror stories as well. My physical therapist up in Maine just loves their patients, but they, they have great patients and they're great physical therapists. So I didn't hear this from them, but people at pharmacy counters, because I've observed it, are crazy. They're just absolutely crazy about, no, no, it's there, it's there. The doctor hadn't called back. Everyone has exploded with busy. There are just demand, and, and he said, this is the cause of why doctors are leaving the profession. It used to be because malpractice premiums went too high. Now they're tired. Uh, now, some doctors are opening concierge practices, and if you pay them a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars a year, they'll let you make a demand on them via email. They're happy to do that, but they are going to limit the number of patients. That won't work in a general care model. And Obamacare is not to blame for this. This is people. This is people in the age of image that Dr. Kissinger talks about. In this book back here, if you're watching on the Salem News Channel, I have behind me Henry Kissinger Leadership. Because it's such a dire prediction of what's going to happen in the age of image. And so I would encourage all of you to please, please stop demanding things. You are not entitled to demand from a doctor an MRI or a prescription. You are not entitled to do that. They're medical professionals. They have to see you. And he wasn't asking me to do this. I just was struck by this. This is the biggest change in his life. I haven't seen him in two years. Biggest change in his life to the kind of demands that patients are making on them. This brings me to Southwest Airlines. All of us got around the table. And we all have first world problems, right? We don't have second world problems, but we all had had travel difficulties. One person's house was completely destroyed by a burst pipe. So they're resigned. It's not an insurance. It's just going to take forever for their, their vacation, their dream home where they're going to retire to, to get built again. It's just total because of a, of a burst pipe. And that's happening everywhere. That, that was a source of discussion. But travel woes. And, and I talked about our crew on Alaska Airlines they were great as usual. I love Alaska Airlines. They were exhausted. And the Southwest Airline people, the crews are not at fault. The CEO came out and said, we are sorry. We never planned for, we never prepared for this kind of an event. It's a once in a century set of storms across the United States. We'll refund your money. We're going to make good. The gate agent isn't responsible. Southwest did not want this to happen to you. Nobody is responsible for a one a once a year, once a century event. So just kind of lighten up at the airport as well. It's my lecture on civility for the year. Stop dropping the F-bombs on Twitter as well. That's part of my resolution is how to tr teach people how to use Twitter. I mean, collectively, Americans have become less civil over the last decade and in the last year, extraordinarily so. Nothing but civility, even when I think you're kind of a Steelers fan. 1-800-520-1234. If you're a doctor and that resonated with you, call me. 1-800-520-1234. My New Year's resolutions are coming up on this last live broadcast from Studio West on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Stay with us. 
Welcome back, America. It's you here with the last live broadcast of 2022. Time for New Year's resolutions. All right, I do this every year. Then I put it under the printer and I moved them last year. So I lost last year's New Year resolutions. So I don't know if I kept them or not. Uh, I have an overarching New Year's resolution in three parts and then I have 20 specifics. All right, so the overarching resolution is be kind to people. All right, this is this just goes generally across the board. Be civil, be kind excise cruelty from your life. You don't have to make the sarcastic remark. You don't have to dump on people uh, and express gratitude. This is, <clears throat> you know, it's part of the shtick on this show that, that um, I give Dwayne a hard time all the time, but Dwayne's the best radio producer in America. He, and he knows I know that, but it's good shtick to give him a hard time. Don't do shtick all the time with people. Express gratitude sometimes. Just tell them Thank you. The doctor conversation last night made that really drove that home to me that America's got a gratitude gap that is enormous and people take for granted everything that we've got that nobody else has. And it's not all bad out there. It's every day there's someone that crosses your path for whom you can be grateful. Do that. Okay. Specifics. Number one, I'm going to reread Arthur Brooks from strength to strength. It may be the book I've recommended the most in the last year, and I think From Strength to Strength is absolutely necessary for anyone over the age of 50. And if you have parents who are over the age of 50, give them From Strength to Strength. How to move from fluid intelligence to crystallized intelligence, how to be happy in your second half or your third third. Arthur Brooks nailed it. Reread it. Number two, uh, Twitter rules. Find a way to encourage people to drop the F-bomb and other vulgarity from their Twitter. It is almost an automatic mute for me. I hate profanity. I really absolutely will not follow people who invoke the Lord's name as an expletive. I hate the F-bomb. It's just the way I was raised. And I don't know if people don't know that. Uh, not about me, but generally. There's a whole segment of the population that recoils from vulgarity and profanity. It's not funny. It's unnecessary. You know the old line about mom, people who lack vocabulary use. Look, everybody sometimes uses an expletive. That's not, but to use an expletive on Twitter is an intentional thing. You have to drop the F-bomb intentionally. So I have, I have, a, I have a resolution to be generous on Twitter not to go, I just don't want to be in Twitter fights with anybody. I, I generally don't anyway, but I'm just not, I'm going to refuse. I'm going to mute and I'm going to try and encourage people. Lose the F bump. You lose the audience. You absolutely lose your audience when you do that. Number three, pray for people I really don't like. Now, I have a list. I'm not going to share it with you. Public people that I really, really don't like. This is not the Joe Biden. I like Joe Biden. I think I wish him well. I think Dr. Joe Biden's a good person. I, I try my, and I think Ron Klain's doing his best. They're just wrong about it. They're not rotten. But in the rotten world, I need to pray for people that I find rotten. That is absolutely necessary. This is a religious thing. It's a Catholic thing. I'm going to go to confession at least once a month. That's number four. Uh, generally, I will go three months or four months unless I've missed mass, in which case... You have to go to confession in order to receive the sacrament. That's a little Catholic thing. But I've got to find the right priest, and I'm going to try and counsel priests. It's not therapy. You don't need to know my life. I'm 66 years old. Knock it off. Get people in and out. There's a line, and they're waiting. And so to all the priests out there, yesterday a priest asked if they could post, if they could take my Washington Post column on good and evil and absolute standards and put it in their bolt. And I said, yes, I'll handle the post if they get mad at you. Uh, and I was very, very flattered. I didn't tell him, how's your confession practice? Are you in the box a lot and are you quick? Because uh, that's what people want. That's what we'll get. It's when uh, therapeutic confession rose in the 80s that people stopped going. If they get back to, these are my sins, please uh, uh, absolve them via the scriptural authority to do so and move on. Number five, I want to get people onto the universe and get them listening to the grand old pod. I am going to push this so hard. Because of the reaction in the first month of the Grand Old Pot. Stuff people never hear. It never makes the news what the Republican Party is doing at every level. It doesn't make the news on what the 17 candidates are doing that's good. They don't know the little. They don't know the small. It's all about the former president and about Ron DeSantis. And God bless them both. They're both big major political figures that need to be covered. 
But there's a lot going on in the Republican primary on the policy side and on the debate side and on the on the whole race for the presidency. And it's all at the grand old pod. I'm also going to make a note on HughHewitt.com to start publishing OTR, off the record stuff. Stuff that's gossip, but I think pretty good gossip. It's not gossiping in the biblically uncertain way. It's just, I hear X is going to run for Y or X doesn't like Z. Stuff like that, if it's useful, I'm going to put it up at, at HughHewitt.com. But you got to subscribe to The Universe. I'm in love with the grand old pot. It's working very well. Generalissimo is a great contributor to it. We've got the audio that no one else has because we go looking for it in local media about people like Chris Sununu, Glenn Youngkin, Larry Hogan. I mean, we got 17 people who are going to run, I think. Number six, I'm going to try some new things in classroom teaching con law because there's a deficit among lawyers in their ability to express themselves. And it's not really my job in con law to teach people how to be advocates. But the advocacy gap has gotten so dramatic. The inability to speak without likes and ums and terrible grammar has cratered. So I'm going to try some new things this, this year. I'm going to make my students brief cases orally. I may have them stand to do so because you always stand when you advocate in a courtroom. You're usually sitting if you're advocating in an administrative law setting. But to advocate, you have to practice. It's not easy. If you weren't in speech and debate in high school, you're not going to be very good at it. So I'm going to try some new things in the classroom. Number seven, I want to teach undergrads again. I've already written uh, Danielle Estrupa, who's the president of Chapman. Do you think I could teach undergrads in the fall? Law students are great. Believe me, they're great. I love law students. They're paying a lot of money. They've got to pass a bar exam. They're serious. I would like to teach undergraduates how to love to learn and to be curious and how to recapture reading. Henry Kissinger made me uh, very much a pessimist about this. The age of image and devices are destroying the ability to engage in a serious fashion with a text and think about a complex thought. So I want to teach undergrads, maybe at Chapman. If any university in Maine wants me as a visitor, just call me. Uh, that leads me to number eight. If I get an invitation, I'm just not going to turn it down automatically. An invitation to do something hard. I got approached by a college this year. Do I want to be a college president? I said, absolutely not. Then I talked last night via text with my buddy who's gone back to be a college president again at 66. I just think it's a very hard job and uh, almost impossible. I just said, I don't want to do it. This year, I will accept the invite for institutes of politics and for undergraduate institutions or for law school deans. If somebody wants me, I'll at least explore it instead of saying no. If I get an invitation to anything that's interesting, I will try not to say automatically no. I'm very busy. The only place you see me on TV is Brett Baer's special report. I'll be on it tonight because life is getting shorter. The life expectancy, you know, at my age and I'm in great health, I got 25 good years, maybe 30 unless God wants to take me tomorrow and or today for that matter. And that'll be fine too. I know what I'm going to do after the next life. But if I get it, just inconvenience is generally why I say no to people. I just don't want it. I'm going to try and say yes. Um, number nine, Father Michael Schmitz does Bible in a year. That was last year, one of Resol and, I, and we did it. Fetching Mrs. You and I have done it. We have heard the entire Bible. It's not done yet. We got to do it today and tomorrow. And I'm saving up for them for the long trundle tomorrow at Huntington Beach. Father Mike Schmitz, Bible in a year, is an amazing podcast. He's starting a new one, the Catechism in a year. Okay, I'm going to try and do that. And he's a great teacher, and he's a fine speaker, and he's extraordinarily adept at verbalization. The Catechism is nobody's idea of a fun podcast, but I'm going to give it a chance. And the Catechism in the year, that's down there. Number 10, I'm going to help identify and encourage good Senate candidates in the races. Where I think Ryan Zinke should run for Senate in Montana. There, I said it. Ryan Zinke should run for Senate in Ohio, in Montana. In Ohio, Bernie Marino and or Matt Dolan should run and nobody else. Those two ought to start having a debate everywhere across the state and, and model a civil race. So, and I'm going to encourage good Senate candidates because we got to get the Senate back for the next Republican president so we can confirm some judges. Liberals are getting on the court. That's fine. I want to balance you to share. I want the sense. But... We need to get the Senate back. We need to get a president back to make nominations that put good judges like Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell did. And to do that, we need good Senate candidates, not bad ones. So I'm going to be very upfront and very early 
so that we don't get knuckleheads running for Senate that would lose a seat. We cannot lose any more seats uh, that are easy to win. I am number 11, going to find and encourage primary candidates for anyone who votes against Kevin McCarthy on the first ballot or votes present. Uh, really, I think we need to challenge them in the primary. I'm a party man. I'm a Republican. And I, I, I have thought these last two weeks are the stupidest two weeks I've seen by five elected members of Congress in my life. The Republicans have a obligation to prepare this country for a long Cold War against China. And these five individuals are putting their selfish political agendas and their personal animosities about Kevin ahead of the good of the country. And I'm going to find candidates to run against them. I'm going to encourage people. I'm going to name them, tell them where the districts are, try and raise money for them. Um, number 12, the Washington Post column. I got 580,000 views of my Agnew option column. I've never had anything remotely like that. It got 10,000 negative comments. So if you're going to write a column that sticks, you're going to have to, the, the multiple is 50 to 1. If you want to see what the latest column is, just multiply by 50. It might be 60 to 1. And it's because it was positive and upbeat and it suggested a solution. It's what Brett Baer is doing on the air on Special Report. It's Common Ground. Peace. I'm going to try and do that here. Um, number 13. Lucky 13. I want to raise money for Hillsdale. Because Hillsdale is the last best hope for higher education in America. It's also the last best hope for the Hillsdale Initiative for charter schools. And if you've got money in your pocket, if you're a big donor, give it to Larry Arn to extend the Hillsdale model. Uh, you know, if they can get a second and a third campus open and running in places, let them go forth and do it. I want to get people to give money. And if you're a small donor, join Hillsdale, sign up for Imprimus. I'm not being paid to say this. Uh, the Hillsdale Dialogue's coming up. Arn and I are good friends, but I am convinced we've got to save secondary education. We have to revive Catholic education. We have to get Hillsdale more money. And if you're making a year-end donation, go to hillsdale.edu and make it there. Number 14. I'm going to prepare the reading list I promised many of you of how to be literate in 2023. I've had a, the necessary bookshelf over at hughhewitt.com forever. I've got to update it. Number uh, 15, and I'll do the rest after the break. Uh, number 15, I need to write a book. And I said I was never going to write another book. I need to write a book on what I see coming. It's not good. It's not good for the culture. Tom Spence at Regnery and I have talked about it. I think I'm going to do it. We'll find out. The rest after the break. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. I want to finish my New Year's resolutions. I'm on, uh, I just did number 15. Although I said I was never going to write another book, I feel like one's coming up. If you look behind me, I've got uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I've written 16 books. Now, that's sort of cheating. 14 of them and two of them were republished and, and, and expanded in new material, so it's kind of cheating. But 14 books or 16 books, you count it as you want. I didn't think I would ever do 17. The return on investment is, is low, but... I think I see some stuff coming, so I'm going to do that. Number 16, uh, be very public about being a Christian. Preach Christ and sometimes use words, famous phrase, attributed often to St. Francis, not sure. Uh, and do it for free when I have to, like when I get invitations to a men's breakfast. The Washington Speakers Bureau won't love that because uh, WSB has an exclusive right to book me as a speaker. And they do it. They do a fine job. But some people can't afford fees. So maybe if they can get me there on travel... Number 17 is tough. I'm going to actually take a hard look in 2023 at the Brown season tickets. I bought them since 1999. Four tickets on the 50. My whole family loves it. You know, they've never had a playoff game since 1999. The Cleveland Browns have never had a playoff game at First Energy Stadium. And if they don't get there next year, I think I'm done. Uh, my brother tells me it's not until I give them up that they're actually going to win the Super Bowl. So that's in the back of my mind as well. But I've had them for 25 years. 25 years of season tickets, and they've never had a playoff game at First Energy. So I'm thinking I'll be done if they don't make it. That's a New Year's resolution, at least to talk about it with you. Number 18. i got to go hear Mark Whitlock preach. I haven't heard him preach. He's at uh, Reed Temple in Maryland. And I used to hear him preach when he was in Irvine and at First AME in uh, South Central Los Angeles. And Mark may be the most gifted preacher I know uh, in America. I, I've got great ones. I've got great, Larry's a great preacher. Mark's a great preacher. Patrick's a great preacher. Jacob's a great, I've heard great preaching all over. 
Mark Whitlock is a different tradition and a different style. I haven't heard him in a couple of years because it's in Maryland. Who wants to drive to Maryland on a Sunday morning? Not me. Um, and then number 19, find good podcasts and recommend them to you. I already told you about the Grand Old Pod. I think that's a necessary podcast. You have to join the universe. Mary Catherine Ham has a great podcast. The Comfortably uh, uh, Smug and Josh Holmes do Ruthless podcast. But I also think about Julie Hartman. Julie Hartman is a great new pa podcast called Timeless. Stephen Means, who's a Cleveland.com writer, has an ad out for NIL Now. I sent him a text last night or a direct message. Where is it? I can't find it. I want to, I want to know about name, images, and likeness. I get asked by a lot of young people about agents, and, and I'm not myself an agent, nor do I want to be, but I know good agents, and there are a lot of scandals and scandals in there. And NIL has changed it, and i got to get smart, so I want to find that. You know I listen to Buckeye Talk, Doug Lee Marie, Stephen Means, Nathan Baird, best podcast, period. If you want to learn how to podcast, listen to that podcast. I also like Orange and Brown Talk because I'm a Browns nut. But I'm going to find other podcasts. And then finally, number 20, um, if you see a stressed person, go and unstress them. If you see someone having a hard time, help them out. That's, that's not basic Christianity, though it is part of the Christian canon. But stress is everywhere, and people are melting down. Try and be a stress reducer to strangers. Now, I want to show you a picture. You put up the picture, Jacob. This is the Times of Israel today of Benjamin Netanyahu. If you didn't hear my Netanyahu interview, Google Hewitt and Netanyahu. I talked to him. Oh, it's frozen. That's too bad. There's a brand new cabinet. And the Times of Israel, there it is. It's up on the Salem News Channel. 36, 31 members of the cabinet, including Netanyahu. He is, his first time as prime minister was 1996. He's back with all those people. I just can't believe. And, and Bibi's never not interesting. He's like the Israeli version of every interesting politician ever. And the interview I did with him about his book, Bibi, My Life, you go and listen to it. It's so fabulous. I also want to thank everyone who contributed to Prison Fellowship. I want to thank you, thank you, thank you. And I will encourage you to go to the top of HughHewitt.com. If you meant to, you'll hear me mention it one more time next hour when I'm talking to Larry Arn. Please don't forget it. They're now getting, they go immediately from Angel Tree to preparing the summer camp. Reach out, and I want you to do that. But I go back to two things of my 20 resolutions. Give money to Hillsdale. They don't pay me to do that. We need the Hillsdale Charter School Initiative to thrive in the United States. We need Roman Catholic education to revive in the United States. We need private schools to revive. We need school choice on the Ducey model out of Arizona. Ohio needs to adopt it. Iowa needs to adopt it. Texas needs to adopt it. Everywhere that there is a red governor and a red legislature, you have to bring school choice in because the public schools are failing and they're failing dramatically. And they're failing with ideological indoctrinization that is just quite remarkable. One of my small group members last night has an eighth grade teacher for a son who's just had it. They were obliged to take down the Gadsden flag. Unbelievably. They were obliged to take down the Gadsden flag, which has been in his classroom for 17 years, teaching American history about the revolution. We need parochial schools, private Christian schools, private charter schools, and public charter schools built on the Hillsdale classical model to grow and thrive. Go write a big check to Hillsdale. It'll be the best thing you did this year. Thank you, Adam and Jacob. Thank you, Generalissimo. The Hillsdale Dialogue is ahead. Volume 11 of Churchill's History of the English-Speaking People. Don't go anywhere, America. It's Hugh Hewitt, the last broadcast day from Studio West. Stay tuned.